Okay, so right now we're going to be looking at um, the prostate, in particular uh, two conditions, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer. So let's just, um, actually before we begin with any of those, let's just take a quick look at the anatomy of the prostate. Uh, it's right below the bladder, so I can just uh, draw the bladder here real quick. So there is the bladder, and there's the... Uh, transitional cells right there and uh, you have the seminal vesicle uh, which also goes through the prostate uh, and into there and so this is going to be your urethra uh, and then you know the urethra is going to curve like that uh, so the prostate well, we have our uh, internal sphincter here then we have the prostate is a big bulge, right, I I encompassing the uh, urethra and the um, ejaculatory duct of the seminal vesicle. And then you have your external sphincter here, and then this is your uh, perineum right below that. Now, there's a few zones which are important uh, to understand. Um, the first zone is the central zone. The central zone pretty much uh, goes around the ejaculatory duct, uh, like that. And then um, after that, we have the uh, peripheral, uh, sorry, the transitional zone. Transitional zone is on both sides of the urethra. So something like that. And it's kind of like 3D, so it's going to wrap around the uh, urethra. And it, it pretty much encompasses the urethra. And then finally, we have the peripheral zone which is right here. So this is peripheral zone, this is transition zone, this is central zone. Now, uh, where do you have your uh, malignancies? Most often malignancies will be here. This is where you'll get your prostate cancer. Um, of course you can get it, and, and let's just, probably better way to put it is uh, for, let's just put prostate cancer. Uh, in the peripheral zone, there's it's usually found 60-70% of the time. Um, then in the central zone, which is around the ejaculatory duct, uh, that's your second most common. Uh, and that's going to be around 25% of the time. And then finally in the transition zone, which is the actual area which you know wraps around the urethra, that's going to be 5% of the time. Now, where is uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia found? It's mostly found in the transition zone. Now this is why benign prostatic hyperplasia has more of the urinary symptoms, such as uh, hesitancy and, and things like that, where the prostate cancer doesn't, because it doesn't really wrap around uh, the urethra. So yeah, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's go on to um, discussing benign prostatic hyperplasia first. So benign prostatic hyperplasia, it's often uh, written as BPH for short because it is a handful or mouthful uh, to say that in one go every single time but I'll write the whole thing out oh, that was kind of that again. so benign prosthetic hyperplasia okay so first let's talk about the pathology um, before we get to that um, an interesting point to note is that the prostate is uh, heavily influenced by DHT and testosterone uh, however, DHT is 10 times more um, influential on the prostate than testosterone. And they both are acting via the uh, antigen receptor. Now, within the prostate, t testosterone is converted, to, it is converted to DHT. And this is done by an enzyme caused, uh, called 5-alpha uh, reductase. Okay, and this causes uh, enlargement of the prostate. Um, and what it'll do, it causes hyperplasia, which is an increase in the number of cells. So what it'll do is it'll cause hyperplasia of two types of uh, cells. First of all, the uh, collagen cells, and secondly, the smooth muscle. And this will lead to two types of uh, uh, two types of way of obstruction. Um, one is going to be, you know, the collagen will cause a sort of physical obstruction 
where as a smooth muscle will cause some sort of mechanical obstruction. It'll contract and then that'll cause the prostate to contract and then block the urethra. And that explains why, uh, you know, for here we would use 5 alpha reductase, you know, to decrease the amount of uh, collagen built up. And here we would use an alpha blocker because uh, alpha blocker will inhibit uh, smooth muscle contraction. Um, along with this, you know, when, when you have contraction for a long time, this does begin to affect the bladder because if you have this blocked here, um, you know, you're going to get uh, hypertrophy even of the smooth muscle, the trusher muscle, sorry, of the bladder and it's also going to, the bladder is going to enlarge and that can cause some pain. So you do get um, uh, bladder enlargement. And this can lead to, um, you know, when the bladder enlarges uh, enough, you can get a, you know, you can get a, f uh, a false diverticula to form, and diverticula just is an outpouching. So, you know, if you have your, your, your bladder, you can get an outpouching like that. Um, and the reason why it's called false is because it, it, it includes all the three layers. Um, now, what are you going to notice clinically? Well, there's two, there's two types of um, uh, etiologies of the symptoms. Uh, the first is going to be symptoms related to the obstruction of the urethra. And then there's going to be other symptoms related to the irritation of the bladder. So you kind of have these two uh, conflicting uh, pathologies underlying this. Now, for the obstruction, what type of symptoms will you have? Well, you're going to have... Um, hesitancy, you're going to have difficulty voiding, uh, uh, you're going to have straining, you know, your, your st the urine stream is going to be a decrease in the force of the urine stream, and uh, there's going to be some dribbling, so, you know, you can, you can kind of figure out everything that would happen if you have a uh, closed or, you know, partially closed urethra. Now, irritative symptoms is going to be caused by the bladder uh, because it's getting overflowed, it's getting bigger, and so that's going to start wanting to contract. And so this is going to give you, you know, the increased urgency and frequency. And this is commonly, you know, when it gets too full, um, you can get nocturia, you know, which is uh, urinating while sleeping. Now, um, these clinical symptoms, they, they do, they are used by um, doctors to evaluate how bad the uh, disease is progressing. And there's actually a um, questionnaire called, uh, which gives a score. And this questionnaire uh, is the international, it's gonna be pretty long, so just bear with me. The International Prostate uh, Symptom Score. It's called IPSS for short. Um, and it's, it's going to be scored out of 35. And based on what the score is, that gives the clinician an idea of how bad uh, the BPH has become. Now, how would you examine this? Uh, or let's say, what kind of investigations would you uh, undertake for a patient with uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia? Uh, the you know most common is going to be the... Uh, digital rectal exam uh, and you know this is basically where you actually try to uh, you put your finger within the rectum and you try to palpate um, the actual prostate um, but here you know this because it affects in the transitional area uh, you don't you're not always able to palpate it and if you do it uh, doesn't uh, correlate with the symptoms so the, the symptoms might be very severe, but you know, you only palpate a small um, prostate. Um, then the other thing is going to be that you can do, uh, that, that you might want to consider doing, is you might want to do a urine analysis. Um, and this is just to, you know, rule out infection, prostatitis, or, you know, some other type of infection that they may be having. Um, then the other uh, marker is a PSA marker. This is going to be found within the serum. Uh, this is a little uh, difficult to use. It's definitely organ specific, meaning only the uh, 
prostate secretes it, but it's, you know, th there's also other conditions that can, within the prostate, uh, that can secrete it, such as cancer, um, you know, prostatitis, uh, many other things. So it becomes a little difficult uh, to always use. And on, 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 um, the other thing is, uh, you know, many people have it normally raised if, you know, uh, even just with a, you know, uh, prostate massage can actually increase it as well. So there's a little bit of difficulty there, but it's definitely a good sign um, to monitor uh, after you know they have it, uh, they have pro uh, BPH. The other thing is uh, you might want to do is you might want to do an ultrasound. Sorry, this is four ultrasound or CT. Um, this is just to kind of look for some of the complications. Um, this is just to uh, identify uh, complications that they may be having. Um, and the other one that's, you know, I'm just going to put it up here even though uh, it's not used commonly, transrectal ultrasound. This is primarily used before surgery just to really go to, uh, you know, the surgeon wants to get an idea of exactly what he's, you know, getting himself into, where, where he needs to focus, what type of approach to take. So now, uh, what are the different treatments? So if a patient has um, BPH, how would you treat it? So let's talk about that. So treatment. Now, as we mentioned, um, actually, before we begin with that, um, watchful waiting. Now, this might uh, seem weird because it's like you know you want to get this thing treated, but if if the patient doesn't have much symptoms, so there is zero to seven on the uh, IPSS score, uh, you might want to just wait. Why? Why is that? Because uh, a lot of times they can spontaneously regress and you don't know if you have that case so you don't want to start giving all this treatment when it would have just regressed anyways so um, that's why you want to just begin with watchful waiting you want to monitor the PSA you want to do continuous digital rectal exams and see how they're progressing and if it's getting worse then you might want to start doing treatment but if it's staying the same or even regressing then you know just uh, let the situation handle itself um, however if it is getting worse uh, we do you know one of the first uh, management thing we can do is you can either give um, we do medical so you can either give an alpha 1 blocker or like I was kind of alluding to earlier you can give finasteride now why would you give an alpha 1 blocker because again there is smooth muscle hypertrophy uh, and you know this can cause relaxation of the smooth muscle that might be constricting the urethra um, and with finasteride, you're just trying to, you know, you're kind of trying to debulk it. You're debulking it by um, decreasing the signal that's causing it to uh, become bigger. And by the way, finasteride is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And like I mentioned earlier, 5-alpha uh, reductase is um, used to convert testosterone into DHT uh, within the um, prostate itself. Now, what are some drugs that are uh, used, the, the actual names of the drugs? Uh, well, we have for um, okay, so we have uh, terazosin and doxazosin, um, which are alpha-1 blockers, and they can uh, help alleviate uh, some of the symptoms uh, so, uh, of, of uh, BPH, and there's also another one which is which is an alpha one A blocker, which is more specific for the prostate, and this is um, uh, tamsulosin, and um, you know alfonosin, and so so there's a few of them, but tamsulosin should be enough. Um, now, the problem is that there's a there's a lot of uh, side effects with this because you have alpha one receptors everywhere. There's hypotension. Uh, all that stuff, but because tamsulosin is um, more specific to the prostate, you have less. You don't. You don't have as much adverse uh, uh, adverse effects. But one effect that you do have in both of them is retrograde ejaculation. And again, that's just because uh, that's kind of a localized symptom to the prostate. So you still have that adverse effect. Now with uh, finasteride, um, the drugs here are going to be, um, so finasteride is one drug, and then there's another one, uh, uh, dutasteride. Uh, this 
affects the D1 and D2 um, isoenzymes of the 5-alpha reductase, and so it just tends to be more effective. Um, now, finally, um, another a treatment option here is going to be surgery. Um, you know, if the medical therapy doesn't work or it's, uh, it's, the symptoms are really severe, you can do surgery and basically you're debulking the prostate. Uh, there's two approaches. Uh, you can go transurethral or you can just do a prostatectomy. Um, it's fairly easy to get to because it's right in the perineum er area. So whether you want to do it endos uh, endoscopic or you want to just do uh, an open uh, surgery, both of them work. Okay, so that's going to pretty much wrap up our BPH. Let's move on to uh, prostate cancer. Um, now, prostate cancer, like I discussed before, is uh, more common in the peripheral zone. So the prostate cancer. So it's more common in the peripheral zone. Um, and when it's in the peripheral zone, it tends to... Um, so if, you, if I can just draw, I'll just draw real quick. So you have your, uh, kind of have your prostate here, your urethra going through here. Uh, then this is your ejaculatory duct. So your uh, peripheral zone was right here, right? This was your peripheral zone. So when, it, when, when the cancer is in the peripheral zone, it tends to evade the, invade the ejaculatory duct. And, uh, just, and this is the seminal vesicle and the seminal vesicle. Um, whereas if you find the cancer in the uh, transition zone, right here, it tends to um, invade into the urethra and then up into the bladder. So depending on where it is, you can get uh, different types of symptoms as well. Now just a little bit of epidemiological uh, facts. Uh, it is the most common cancer in males. But it's, uh, it's not a killer, necessarily. Uh, only 9% of cancer deaths in the United States are related to um, prostate cancer. That's in the U.S. So, of course, you know, lung cancer, and those tend to be much more uh, bigger killers than um, prostate cancer uh, is. So, let's talk a little bit about the etiology, uh, who tends to get it. And why? Um, there is a genetic component related to this, and uh, that's just signified by the fact that um, this is very common in African Americans. Um, and but, however, there's also an environmental uh, diet effect. Uh, it's, it has been associated with um, fat and obesity, and even you know, in general, Asians. Uh, don't tend to have this very much, but when they come over to the U.S., the risk actually goes higher. So this shows that there's some sort of dietary or uh, at least an environmental effect. Uh, the other thing that's definitely associated with is hormones. We know that, um, again, prostate is responsive to testosterone and DHT. And so uh, I even when it becomes cancerous, this will uh, cause um, increased risk of getting the uh, or cause to grow faster and so a lot of treatment modalities will be are going to be targeted at reducing testosterone and finally we have age uh, as you get older um, what tends to happen is you have um, higher estrogen and then this estrogen is going to uh, increase the number of testosterone receptors that you have or androgen receptors that you have and so then it's just basically more sensitive uh, to testosterone so that's going to be uh, the relation there. Now, um, clinical. Now, this can uh, prostate cancer can vary. Um, it can come on very quick, and it can become fatal really quickly. Or you can be pretty much asymptomatic your whole life, and you know die of uh, regular causes, never metastasize, never cause you any problems. And so this is um, why you know. Sometimes it's hard to detect, first of all, but also treatment. You know, sometimes the question is, do you even want to treat? Uh, be, it, just because someone you know has cancer doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have any problems. So, but at the same time, if you don't treat, and this is one of those fatal cases, it becomes very difficult. And uh, a lot of research is going on this, and uh, it's kind of in the air. This is really even complicating a lot of uh, the research because um, 
for example, we can just begin here. Let's talk about screening. Um, a lot of screening that happens, uh, you know, a lot of before, uh, you know, we used to do a digital rectal exam and, you know, PSA, you know, after someone turned about 50, maybe 40, if they had some risk factors. But now, there, you know, some studies are showing that screening doesn't even help. And others are showing that uh, the digital rectal exam is not even, uh, and I think right for right now, they've kind of ruled out digital rectal exam for even doing screening, and they said PSA is the only one. Uh, so, you can see why this is, cr uh, you know, creating a lot of controversy and confusion uh, with regards to this disease. Um, now, the other symptom that you'll have is going to be related to um, local disease. And this is just going to be because it starts, you know, like I discussed earlier, it either goes into seminal vesicle ejaculatory duct if it's in the peripheral zone, or it goes into the... Um, uh, urethra if it's in the uh, transition zone. So if you have local disease, then this is going to be very similar to BPH symptoms. The uh, uh, obstructive uh, complaints such as hesitancy, straining, you know, uh, difficulty voiding, and also the irritative symptoms, uh, which is, you know, frequency, urgency, and nocturia. But again, this is less likely because the transition zone is not usually involved. It's usually the peripheral zone involved. This is the area involved and it grows out so you don't tend to have these urinary complications that you do with BPH. The real symptoms, uh, so you know if that doesn't happen you pretty much you know have very minimal symptoms uh, but then your symptoms will develop upon metastasis and this is going to be uh, an advanced disease. Uh, once you get it very commonly metastasized to bone and it's going to be an osteoblastic type of thing meaning uh, it increases bone growth uh, and unfortunately the bone it chooses uh, is the spine and so you can get a lot of neurological symptoms and obviously pain you know due to compression of the spine so um, and then um, so th th that's going to give you a lot of neurological symptoms and then also uh, you can get uh, symptoms related to your lower extremity uh, and this is basically um, due to, you know, uh, lymph lymphatic, uh, the lymphatic occlusion can cause edema uh, and, you can, uh, it can block veins as well. So you get these uh, symptoms along your lower extremities. Okay, so now what kind of investigation would you do? The, of course, you know, they're not going to be too different from uh, BPH because we're talking about the same organ here. So... Um, <coughs> but let's talk first. First thing you can do a digital rectal exam. Now this is closer uh, with digital rectal exam. It is a little bit more specific for uh, prostate cancer. We discussed before for BPH. It really doesn't. You know, you might feel it. In, you know, it might be small, but the uh, the actual prostate is huge. Uh, so and, and the patient may be even you know symptomless. So it doesn't really correlate well with the symptom. But in in the case of cancer, uh, it does. So you can feel a single, you know, if you feel a single nodule, um, it's, uh, it correlates well with the disease. Um, now, however, there is some differential diagnosis that you do need to be aware of. Uh, you can feel, you could just be feeling a cyst or even a, you know, a, a stone that's just passing through. So you do kind of need to keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is PSA, the prostate specific antigen. Um, now there is, uh, there is a little bit of controversy. Some some people, you know, some labs will give the mark at two, uh, less than two point five is normal. Others will say less than four nanograms per deciliter is normal. Again, prostate. There's many re reasons you can have it normally, uh, you know, uh, and other factors and other pathologies that can cause it. So it's very difficult to say. Someone could just have BPH and that's why it's high. Um, so what there are other ways of measuring it, um, which are important. Uh, a lot of these days they're talking about PSA velocity, which is how quickly the um, PSA is increasing over a period of time. And the other one, they're checking the uh, free PSA versus bound PSA. So they're trying to use PSA in different ways uh, to kind of distinguish is this BPH or is this cancer. Um, and then, of course, you can do uh, transrectal ultrasound to see how 
Uh, again, before surgery, they'll tend to do that. And you can do biopsies. Now with biopsy, there's something uh, that you should know. It's called the uh, Gleason score. The Gleason score. The Gleason score is out of 10. And what it does is you look at it histologically and there's certain features and if it has those features, uh, you give the score one to five. And so you give it to the first, the top two most common features. Um, and then you add them up. So, and then th this kind of helps with uh, prognostically, um, you know, how severe is it? Um, now, with um, investigations, we also have a staging. Uh, you want to do some other investigations related to staging. Um, uh, this does use the old uh, T and M. Uh, so T standing for the tumor and for the nose and for the metastasis. Um, and we'll just kind of go real quick with, uh, with the different types and how they... Um, so you have T1, T2, T3, and T4. Um, T1 means it's clinically in appearance. No symptoms, uh, um, and, uh, and also uh, you can't see it under histology, uh, uh, under your scans and your um, imaging. Um, T2 means it's, it's there, but it's confined to the prostate. And T3 means it went to the extra, it went outside the prostate, prostate capsule, so it went extra capsular, but it, it's not locally invading. And then T4, it means it locally invaded. Um, then we have, you know, for your nodes, uh, you have N0 and N1. N0 means uh, there's no nodes affected, and N1 means greater than 1. As soon as one node is affected, it becomes an N1, and then you have uh, M0 and M1. Uh, this is for metastasis, so M0 means no metastasis, and M1 means a distant metastasis. And uh, so the recent score... Uh, plus this and the PSA will help you figure out um, what stage is it, is it in and then uh, how to treat it. And so moving on to that, we can go into treatment. Um, now because it is so common and uh, you know the prostate is relatively easy to access, there are you know a lot of different treatment modalities uh, that we're going to uh, cover right now. First, um, first thing they want to do. Again, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but you just want to do active surveillance. Like I mentioned, it's the most common cancer in men, but only 9% of the, de the, the deaths in the United States are attributed to this. So uh, you might find it in someone and nothing will happen ever. And they might just live a you know, normal life. So what you would do if you do find that someone has this cancer and it's pretty small, no symptoms, um, you know, the Gleason score is low and you know, T0, N0, or you know, T2, N0, M0, then um, you just want to monitor it. You want to monitor on a, ba a day, on a consistent basis. You want to do your the PSAs. You want to do digital rectal exams. And you want to do biopsies, uh, and you want to make sure it's not growing and it's regressing. And so then that way, if it does grow any further, then you can do uh, some treatment. Um, now, what are the different types of uh, treatment available? Uh, one is going to be using radiation. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll take, uh, they'll figure out exactly where the uh, tumor is and they will uh, take different beams and they'll shoot it and, you know, these beams will cross in one area, radiation beams obviously, and in that area, wherever they cross was where the tissue will have the highest concentration of the radiation and those tissues will die. Unfortunately, um, it, be, it, it has to go through the GIT, either from the front or through the back. And so you can have a lot of GIT complications. Also, um, you know, they, you, you, they can get uh, erectile dysfunction. This is due to a vascular cause uh, rather than a neuro neurological cause. It just messes up with a lot of vessels. And now, actually, um, the new uh, treatment, and I'll have to put this in red, uh, the new treatment, which is uh, very promising, um, it can be used in um, some of the uh, smaller case, intermediate cases to smaller cases, brachytherapy. And brachytherapy is uh, pretty much you take a little pill that has um, is radioactive uh, radioactive material in it, and you insert it into the prostate. So let me just draw it here. So say this is a prostate, and you have the urethra and the ejaculatory duct, uh, and, and the you know let's just say the cancer is here. So you'll take this little uh, pill here. You put it in the middle, 
and the radiation will go out from this pill and this will give you a more homogeneous uh, exposure radiation also the center of the cancer will be have the highest radiation and then it will kind of uh, dissipate out and this has actually been the most effective uh, radiation form of treatment uh, as of right now um, the other thing you can do um, if it's much bigger or radiation didn't help uh, you can do a radical pros radical prospecting um, you can do this now of course you know you have your uh, you, you have to remove that you want it, you to protect the urethra and you want to protect the neurovascular bundle and the ejaculatory ducts um, so and if you don't um, and you damage say you damage the neurovascular turn to the uh, prostate this can lead to erectile dysfunction and if you damage the urethra this can cause uh, incontinence so there is some uh, you know major complications associated with this uh, lifestyle at least and um, you know this needs to be taken into consideration now after um, after you do these treatments you need to continue to monitor uh, the PSA and this is because um, either it's going to be metastasis or it's going to be re uh, uh, a, a regression or not a regression but a resurgence of the um, cancer so it can be either of those things so you want to continue to monitor the PSA and you know, although maybe for screening and for those purposes, PSA, you know, is not useful, for monitoring the progression of the disease or the resurgence of the disease, it's actually very helpful. Um, now, let's just say that um, someone does develop metastasis. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, someone gets metastasis. Uh, what do you do then? Uh, there's, in this situation, um, the, f the first thing that we want to try is for castration. Okay, now there's two types of castration. There's uh, physical castration and there's chemical castration. Um, the best one is to just do an orchiectomy. Uh, and this is just removal of the testes. Uh, and this is the gold standard. This is, um, uh, this is the best form of treatment. Obviously, some people uh, is, are not comfortable with that. Um, so then you can do chemical castration. Uh, this can be done with two drugs, uh, lupulide, ghrelin, which is a um, GnRH analog, and uh, then we have antiandrogens, which basically block the uh, androgen receptor, and so the testosterone pretty much has no effect on it. Now, um, lupulide um, and ghrelin have a little bit of an issue because their uh, GnRH actually will increase testosterone temporarily so there's a, there'll be a temporarily increase but after a while the GnRH will have an inhibitory factor and so um, it'll, blo it'll block it then now anti-androgens obviously they will, they'll start working right away uh, and just and the main an the anti-androgen that we use is uh, flutamide and so sometimes they use it to uh, to you know help during this uh, temporary stage but other times you might, they might just use it uh, as a solitary treatment now um, there are some tumors which are called castration resistant prostate cancer and this means uh, even though you've castrated the patient either chemically or physically um, they still have the tumor still growing it's still there so this a lot of times means um, that the uh, if they have autonomous androgen receptors meaning they don't even need testosterone and they just keep activating themselves um, then you're going to need to just switch to chemo. Chemo is the way to go. You can use uh, docetaxel, which is a uh, which is cytotoxic, uh, metox, uh, mixox, uh, metoxantrone, and there is um, dasatinib. Uh, dasatinib is your uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So uh, this is going to be right as of right now. This is the first line therapy, uh, but you know maybe in the future they'll change. They'll come something different because uh, these therapies tend to change often. Okay, hope that helps.